everybody, welcome back to the Luxury Week. And we are here with Maureen Tongi, who uh, is the CEO and founder of MT Arts. Uh, she has a background as a gallerist and art agent. Uh, hi, Maureen. Thank you for Hello. joining us. Well, thank you so much for having me. Thank you. And I know you're joining us from London today, so in the same country as us. <laughs> um, so I wanted to start by asking you, uh, as an expert in the art world, what emerging trends are you seeing in the art world post COVID-19 and beyond? I feel like um, definitely from ourselves and the kind of projects that people have kind of asked to kind of conduct, um, people want art to be something that lifts up their spirits. So something that's hopeful, that's positive, um, risky, you know, people have been stuck in their houses and they've been looking at their walls and they want something that they get up to look at and is really inspiring. And from a public art perspective, because the agency covers both the sales of artworks, the partnership for public art projects, but also brand collaborations. So if we look at cities, developments, and also brands, we've kind of looked at the same kind of trends where people, you know, want to inspire people, want to make them feel included, united and and in higher spirit so um yeah i, I feel from from our end the artists that have sold are definitely um all conducted projects are definitely uh, people who you know if you look at their works you feel a, a lot happier and and a lot more inspired um can you tell us a bit about the agency itself so it's it's really the first talent agency for visual artists worldwide. Uh, what it, what inspired you to break away from the more traditional gallery model? Yeah, so I've been in the art, in the art world for 11 years. So um, it's been a little journey before I kind of came up with the idea. Um, I was first um, a gallery director for the Outsiders Gallery. So my first boss was Steve Lazaridis, who discovered Banksy. And I was 21 years old at the time. Um, and he basically, it was a fantastic school because he taught me how to spot talent because he's someone that has spotted basically JR, Banksy, a lot of the top ones. But also he also taught me about how um, do you integrate their art, not just in the art world, but you also kind of have artists who to people on the streets. So like JR has done partnerships with the Cannes Festival and his artists kind of been on the streets as well. So that was um, my first school. Then... Um, I was approached at 23 to open my own art gallery in Los Angeles. Um, so at the time I was in London, so I moved from London to LA and then opened my own art gallery with an investor. So he invested the money and I was going to run it, import the contact and establish the structure. Um, and I think it's when I owned that business and, and when I ran it, that I realized that, um, you know, it wasn't an effective business model. It, it wasn't... Um, a scalable business model. Um, I was very lucky at the time to be introduced to Michael Lovitz, who is one of the most famous um, Hollywood agents in the world. So he uh, founded CAA and was behind Jurassic Park, Tim Spielberg, all the big guys in the film sector. And when he told me how he built a talent agency, how he backed talents, and you know, I was behind my little desk waiting for two people a day in this gallery. I was just like, this just sounds so much more like the job I want to do. It will kind of, you know, the projects I will be able to pull out with my artists will be a lot bigger. The scale will be a lot bigger, but also economically, I can grow multiple offices and and hire more people as well. So it just, it, it felt that this was more right. And so I came back um, from Los Angeles to London, split for my first partnership and founded the first talent agency, MT Art Agency here. Um, we now have four offices, so we're London, Paris, Madrid, and Monaco, and yeah, it's it's it's, it's amazing actually. I'm in a, the nicest of times uh, personally because it's in a time where the model is proven, and now it's like tweaking, structuring, hiring, building teams, which of course have loads of challenge challenges. But I'm not worried about you know or not, which, as we all know, as business entrepreneurs, is it's the nicest of feeling when you have a, a stable ground to kind of rest on to. Yeah, it, the success of the agency has been absolutely amazing. Um, and can you share with us some of these projects that you've worked on connecting artists with brands? Yeah, um, so, um, so, okay, so let's take a few cool examples. So do you know in Paris what the Champ de Mars is? 
Mm -hmm. So it's that big strip of land, which is like 800 meters um, of land right in the center. So last year, we got the mayor of Paris to shut it, shut it down uh, historically, so close it, and put um, the hands of our artists, Saint which are biodegradable, and it's like two hands alongside the whole Champ Mars. And that was a partnership with the Guardian Media Groups and also 30 B Corp companies. So B Corps are basically, and that can kind of go along with the philosophy of this week, but companies that, of course, generate profits, but also kind of doing business for good. And that's a classic example of kind of uniting the mayor of Paris, a major media group. It was also on the cover of the Financial Times, and also 30 companies that are aligned values-wise um, to be behind it. Then we, um, you know, more recently, um, the same artist was across 30 screens of the airports in Europe uh, with La Baza, which also was communicating about, you know, the future of their brand and, and why they want their brand to be more progressive. And they specifically used the art of the artists um, to kind of do that and, and kind of the, the major public art that he was doing that was sustainable as kind of the image and the content. So that would be more, um, the first one I would say with the Champ de Mars is an activation and it's using something very dramatic and the brands will be behind it to align themselves with a lot of PR and media. The second one, the example across the airports is more using the art as a content value. So it's basically um, in need of very valuable content and the expertise of the artists. There's also all the limited edition. Um, so we just sold um, over a million of products with Method. Method are a cleaning company, a bit like ASAP, and they're very cool, they're very Californian, and they partner up with three artists, um, you know, that we work with the, with the agency, and we basically designed a super cool campaign, super cool products, and so the art will be incorporated onto the products, then you have all the campaigns behind it, and then the social media. So that is again kind of giving you another angle in which um, the brands will use it. Of course, in the current times, retail activation is not as much used, um, or less for reopening of the stores. So that would be something that I won't talk a lot in depth, but that's kind of a few examples of how we've um, integrated the art with the brands. Mm. You've also done some hotel collaborations as well. Yeah, is that right? yeah and that was actually um, this morning, I had breakfast with the Rosewood, who I absolutely love. Um, we are about to launch a really amazing project with Sofitel, the ACO group, um, in St. James's with the Crown Estate in Westminster. I can't say much more, but it's, it's really special and it will be over the coming months. Um, we've worked with the Rosewood as well, which for anyone, the Crayon in Paris and the Rosewood in London, I literally like jewels, like the architecture is just so beautiful. Um, and that's, that's just a treat because, you know, a big part of um, where I love my job is just is enhancing spaces. And I think when an architecture is such a treat like this and, and you kind of match the art, you, you get such a vision from the two aligning with each other. Um, so Citizen M, we also led their campaign as well, which was something a bit different because it was more led to be very inclusive as well. So it was on different values principles. But yeah, we've worked with many of them. Um, and, you know, I just, for everyone that we work with, um, we act as a talent agency in picking up the best talents, but we also act as a creative agency on these part of the team on making sure that the art is best integrated into the values of who we work with. And it's a nice feeling because as you know, you're also discovering um, amazing stories of those places and their teams and and why they, you know, what they do, the thing that they do so well. So it's always such a joy to kind of align that with, uh, with the artist. And what do you look for in an artist um, when you're looking to sign somebody? Um, so we have a selection committee because we actually get over 200 people applying a month because mm -hmm. we also finance our talents. Uh, so it's not it's not me, it's not Marine States. Um, I mean, you are currently looking at me in, in my personal space, so that's a bit different because that's definitely more my taste. Um, in regards to the company, we are looking for people who are incredibly innovative technically. So like silly things, obvious, our artists sold the first artificial intelligence painting in the world at Christie's two years ago. Um, you know, Sabin, who I just mentioned, the painting that is biodegradable is also his own invention. Then we look for an amazing story. So something that we think, you know, when we listen to the story emotionally, 
you really look up to that person and you look up to the story um, and they all have the most incredible stories attached to the art. And then finally, we look at the personality and I think that's what makes us very different is that we don't just look at the art, we also look at the artist. It's at the heart of the core belief of what we do that success is driven by people. So you can have someone that's very talented if they do not have the right personality, it will collapse. Um, and, and kind of spotting the right personalities is also a big part of, of our job on that sense. Mm. Um, can you share uh, just a couple of your favorite or a few of your favorite artists on your roster at the moment? I say that any artist is my favorite because otherwise I would not be here live. Um, uh, who I would kind of highlight at the minute, Delphine Diallo is um, an artist who, you know, took on the Black Lives Matters that happened recently, uh, was uh, written about in the New York Times specifically for how she empowers women, especially women of color. And she's, you know, she's someone that I feel, I've never seen someone so inclusive actually from all parties and, and her art is so strong and and kind of shows that. It shows, it shows the goodness of her nature to just include everyone constantly in everything that she does. And I think it makes, yeah, it makes her art to be very powerful as you walk into homes or like she was also on billboards in Los Angeles and people were very kind of stuck by her images. So I think that that's one of them that I would say. Um, obvious are the ones that I've just mentioned. And, you know, I feel they are like 25 years old kids um, and they already broke a record for half a million at Christie's for being the first AI painting I kind of ever made that sold at auction. So I would just watch them out because um, I have to just read so much every time I speak to them because they really are completely geeky in their own ways. Um, but I highly, highly believe that they're going to be very successful. Um, so I will kind of also uh, think about them. There's a little surprise and I can't reveal more, but we're about to sign one of the first robots that's making art. And we actually went and visited her in her studio because it's a her. Mm -hmm. um, and she's also reflecting on the ethics of digital arts. And I'm quite excited about this because I'm quite excited about the digital mind to be reflecting on itself, which um, as the next yeah. philosophy student, I think this is a fascinating thought. So yeah, that's basically the ones I will discuss. That's really fascinating. I, um, I wrote an article about uh, digital avatars in the fashion world recently to oh, see if coming cool. through into the art world is again very interesting because it is the is it the personality of the creator or yeah. do they sort of instill personality within the robots itself and sort of you see this in the fashion world with um sort of digital avatars like little Michaela and Shudu. Um, yeah. so yeah it's gonna be will your robot artist be available for interview for example will they yeah, have she's a actually, um done a TED talk um <laughs> so I'm showing you to find out who she is by yeah. saying this and she's not far from you because she's um was made by Oxford University and actually a team of women as well um which is even more exciting mm -hmm. from that front because there's been a lot of discussions around that um I yeah I, it's it's just you know it's just really interesting because for me like I just I'm super lucky to have got a job that constantly helps me answering questions I have. So, and my artists, and that's what we always say, we invest in people, we invest in artists in that sense, is they literally pose, me, they, they challenge me with problematics that I can't figure out myself. And then you keep on going with them. And I think the collectors and the partners we work with love it because we're all on that little journey on that topic and we'll be exploring with people who are uber talented. Um, so yeah, it's, I'm just excited again to embark on a different journey just like, you know, Seipi is embarking on sustainability and I've learned so much in that process as well. It's it's like we are doing multiple PhDs because we have to make sure we understand their art very well and then integrate it and, and advise others on how they can integrate it as well. So it's just a lot of fun. It's like being at school daily. Um, it's so interesting. So, you know, we talked a bit about the connection between art and technology, but... Um, what, in your opinion, is the connection between luxury and art? I think um, it's interesting because so I'm very lucky and privileged now to be in the life of luxury. And I think, you know, we all know that how lucky we are to be in that sense. Um, um, but luxury um, for me, in terms of my job, and um, it's more about the craft, is everyone that I've ever worked with in the luxury 
uh, sector cares so much about details. And I learned so much from them for that matter. When we when we work with Chloe, just the way they kind of photograph even the objects and kind of went about the referencing and and everything that they did is so heavy in in regards to caring for details, caring for the vision, caring for the message, caring for the philosophy. So I like to think that therefore my obsession for luxury is more how the care and, and the attention to detail that is basically being put in. Because I also am aware that not everyone can lead um, a life of luxury um, from that matter on. So I think that's what's available for luxury. So for me, even if you can't afford luxury, but you um, you go on our digital channels, then you'll be able to kind of access people who are absolutely fascinating and kind of show you that detail. And you can still appreciate, even if you go for a cup of tea at the Rosewood, you can still appreciate how beautiful the building is, how everything was put together. That's what I like about luxury. It's a storytelling as well. It's usually like, you know, amazing storytelling. Um, in regards to kind of the artworks, you know, you can sense it, I think, as we grow in profile, you know, my bigger artists definitely have a sense of perfectionism with regards to kind of the works that they execute and how they go about it. And and it's the same as, you know, I'm sure it's the same that you will relate to, but the way I treat my clients and the way everything is kind of run, there is a difference um, if you're in the luxury market or not. Um, because I love building up relationship, I do enjoy that side because I love sending flowers and cards to my clients and I love being in close proximity to them and and that is something that again the luxury sector can can give you that the art sector also have in common because those relationships are very key um, and that network is very key um, so yeah that's that's really but I you know even when I couldn't afford it um, to be in a life of luxury I will still be that person who will go for that cup of tea in a beautiful environment because it is that sense of aesthetics. It's, it's, it's aspirational, I think, to kind of look up and be inspired by all of this. From a branding perspective, it's um, looking at every aspect of your business and kind of applying the same level of detail, attention to yeah. detail, to all, to all of it. Um, yeah, absolutely. And, and that's something that, um, yeah, I hope that we do. You know, we will care about every single detail and and every single person, whether they come through digital or their partners, their collectors, their community, or you know, we will make sure that they feel cared for and they're part of that that whole relationship. Um, Lancia agrees. She says, absolutely, luxury is all about the craft. Um, amen to that. <laughs> um, so, Maureen, as an entrepreneur, what are some of the key lessons you've learned over the years? in business um, i mean i think as you know yourself um you know you learn every day <laughs> so like they i'm not going to be listing like 400 lessons um mm -hmm. i feel the the key lessons are you know i'm very careful on what i say how i say it um i think my empathy has, has incredibly kind of been augmented um to being an entrepreneur because you you are constantly careful about, you know, can you hurt someone? Who do you manage? Who do you care for? Like you've got responsibilities over other people. And I think whether that's your talents, your clients and your team, um, there's a greater sense of making sure that the other people are actually cared for. And, and now I've learned, I've learned how to manage conflicts. I've, I've learned how to manage expectations. I've learned how to communicate difficult news and to kind of do it better and better to the stage that it's not something that's difficult to take on. It's still, Hard when it's a bad decision, but it's, it's still something that hopefully is not as harsh as when you start um, on that basis. Um, similarly, I would say um, kind of sticking to the facts constantly is something is unfair, picking up early. Um, you know, I'm, I'm lucky, I'm not saying I'm famous by any means, but I'm enough in the public eye that I have to be careful again at what I say and how I say it. And, and you know, we've had times people are trying to attack or making false accusations. and at the start of your company, I think you um, you want to hide away and, and just ignore it. And I think as you grow as an entrepreneur, you kind of learn to face with facts and and respectfully and and calmly and kind of move on. Um, so I think it, it's a whole degree to kind of managing yourself because you. It was fascinating about being an entrepreneur is the pressure that you can take on and the stress you can take on, uh, keep on getting higher. So you grow as well, like. A little conflict five years ago will mean that you were talking about it for two weeks and now you maybe talk about it for half an hour and then you kind of strategize it and kind of move forward. Um, I knew that before I started because I've always loved building 
strong relationship, but I think nurturing relationship is everything. Like we're just coming out of the confinement and realistically, like my business is thriving thanks to people. And that is that is kind of the community angle is is huge. Um so for anyone that's listening, um it doesn't matter how perfect your product is, um, if you have that community, if you're constantly kind of nurturing your network, you are in such a position of strength um, uh, as a business person. Um, and yeah, and I think, you know what, I think for me, it's just really people management. I've learned a lot. I've grown as a person to understand people better. And I'm sure in 10 years time, I will feel that I know even more about people, but I actually enjoy it as a learning curve again, because I enjoy um, understanding people better. So, but that that is definitely one of the fastest learning curve that you get from it. Is that a bit of a surprise for you? Because um, obviously you went into the art world, and then now you've sort of gone through it. And the more responsible you are for more people, you end up taking this very managerial leadership role. Um, was that always there in you, or is it something that kind of surprised you and it? I feel like you know I don't know I don't, I've always been someone that was very chapters led um so I think it's because I love uh, novels but I'm all about the chapters so I you know I was a 25 years old founder that was literally uncompromising I could not make a single compromise and I could not have a single gray opinion it's like everything was so um kind of frontal about what the opinion was when I founded the business and I look back and that was the right thing at the time because you know you're establishing a new idea you have to be so solid in why this idea is necessary to kind of enter this market and i feel again now that the idea is more established and it's a different chapter for me that to learn that other people can lead this idea not me anymore and and that the idea can grow i think it's just in a weird way my company has kind of um grew side by side with me as i grew older as well like i just i'm not the same age anymore you know as we all know, like a 25 years old is much more uncompromising than someone like, you know, a few years later. So it's just, it's it's more that you grow, I think. And and as you grow, then the chapters and the roles that you occupy in making sure that your company is okay changes. Um, and I'm glad therefore that I was that at the start because I don't think I could have been that person anymore just simply because I don't have black and white opinions anymore. Um, I'm much more moderated in my approach to doing things. Um, but at the time, you needed someone that was much more, uh, yeah, much more kind of like this. So it's more really that it's following a course of of chapters. And, and I can't wait that people from our agency go and found other agencies and that there's another chapter added and another layer added to what we're doing uh, where we can learn from those people, you know. And how do you see the story developing? Like, what's what is the future of MTR? look like i think well i'm very definitely that's this is the issue is i was lucky almost by accident because my parents don't come from the art world at all um that i bump into the most ambitious people who had accomplished a lot really early in my life so therefore my ambition is really quite big so that it's but i think it's just because you know i have met michael novitz who built ca at 28 and therefore made it a billion company and on our board um Frédéric Jousset has also made a billion company where the help uh, injures. So I, I'm sorry by people like this now, where therefore I, I would like a CA for the arts. I would like MTR to kind of become that. And and yeah, and now I'm just generally trying to map it out if we can do that, you know, and and kind of understanding, um, again, people-wise, who will be part of that story and, and how do we pick the right people to kind of get to that. So, um, but my story may not all be MTR, I think already, as a person I um, collect, I am more of a philanthropist as well, um, outside of my own company. I definitely mentor other entrepreneurs as well. So, you know, it's just, it's an interesting thing as well as the business grows is that um, you know more just your business, whereas I was that at the start. Um, for me, MTR is, is the proof that someone who doesn't come from means can actually impact a sector and support his talents better through that and create amazing projects out of it. Uh, but I'm excited to see if we can do that more, if we can build companies that do that, or I can help and enable other companies kind of, kind of have a similar impact into the sector. Mm -hmm. um, that's so interesting. And um, you've done a couple of TED Talks, which are great. <laughs> and Thank I you. just wanted to um, 
talk about one of the subjects you talked in the uh, is it the King's College one where you were talking about yeah, yeah about uh, sort of social media, um, visual stimulation, and the consumption of junk imagery. And uh, just one statistic I have um, from 2014, so it's a few years out of date, but I can only imagine this is bigger now. Um, according to Mary Meeker's annual internet trends report, people uploaded an average of 1.8 billion digital images every single yeah. day. Um, yeah. 657 billion photos. Yeah. Right? Um, so obviously we're, bit, we're bombarded with this imagery, not all of yeah. it's good. Um, so what are the dangers of living in a world obsessed with the consumption of junk imagery? Um, so I feel this is a, this is a thing that really um, bothered me when I entered the sector. So as a background, my mom is a primary teacher, my, my dad is a sport teacher. So I came, I grew up on the west coast of France, Ile de Ré, which I'm actually going back with my son on Sunday, which I'm very excited mm -hmm. about. And it's so a very far away from like uh, luxury or the arts or anything like this. But I loved art and, and I loved creativity. And for me, like being in a world that was aesthetically inspiring made me feel a lot happier. So mm -hmm. I kind of entered the sector and could continue that kind of journey to kind of get in. Um, but what bothered me was the fact that um, people looked at the art as something superficial, something that will come right at the end. If you very, very, very successful, then maybe you will come to kind of my sector right at the end. Was for me, it's, it's um, you know, having streets are inspiring, um, consuming a product that is visually inspiring, going on your digital with having imagery that makes you feel better, it should be at any stage in life. Um, it should not be something that I just wait when I'm 50 and, and I've kind of saw my first company. So um, I was disillusioned with my sector because it did feel that that demographic didn't exist. Like it was very much a type of demographic that we're kind of coming through. And, and I was worried that therefore um, there was deep inequalities between who got exposed to what kind of imagery. So let's say my son now, he is going to kind of grow up surrounded by art and by people who kind of value imagery and then he'll be taken to different places where he has imagery. So his diet, his visual diet daily, will be very different to a kid that is not exposed to the arts, you know. Um, Love Island is your first TV show in the UK. Then um, your first top 10 influencers on Instagram are more the likes of the Kim Kardashian. So all the imagery that's being consumed, and that's also on adverts in the streets as well, by a young girl that's like 14 years old, is 90% of imagery that makes, us feel, that makes her feel insecure, that makes her feel to consume more, and basically addicted um, to get that kind of content because that content doesn't fulfill you. So it kind of constantly makes you addicted. And so that's why we came up with the idea of a visual diet. Um, so it's kind of timely because Boris Johnson woke up to one. So we can we can say this is the right timing to waking up to diets this week. Um, but, it, you know, the idea is that when you get up in the morning and you look at your phone, the first 10 images that you're going to see will impact you. If two days later, if you've seen a super skinny influencer, you feel a bit fat is because you know that is tracked through where you've been looking at your phone right mm -hmm. then if you go on your streets and you kind of look at your adverts so if anything on your street reinforces where you've been looking at your phone you are getting messages constantly that's incorporating your brain but also telling you who to become it doesn't matter if you spend an hour in a museum a month and if you think you are empowered elsewhere like you're being targeted in a visual way to kind of become someone that's very different. And and that's the awareness we wanted to say. There's a saying that says that um, five, the five people that surround you the most are the ones that define you. And our, you know, our thinking was to say that the image that surround you the most is very much what shapes you as a person. So we conducted studies to kind of look at two things. One, obviously, what happens when you look at a certain type of imagery and versus looking at other type of imagery. The result was clear. There's a type of imagery that makes you super addicted and you need more and more and more to consume. And another type that makes you happy, so you actually can close your phone and move on and then kind of look at it. In. Um, and we, there's also a study that came up in France that we kind of were linked to um, on the, how the algorithm kind of knew that and make sure that you look at a content that is more addictive ultimately. So, you know, that means that you spend more time on the app because you are addicted to a content that is making you feel crap and, and 
and kind of having you to kind of have a look at more. So visual diet is kind of a basic self-awareness. If you feel a bit crap or if you kind of look around your surroundings, retidy your room, kind of do something, buy some flowers, look at them, you know, if you can afford it, obviously get some art. If you um, look at your phone, just retidy who you follow. But just have an awareness. It's not just words. You know, we always hear about tweeters and the haters, but actually images have such a strong influence on how we feel. And I think the confinement showed that. I think people who were happy about their surroundings did much better than the ones who were not happy in, in kind of where they were as well. I think that's really good advice. You know, edit the kind of people that you surround yourself with and also edit the kind of imagery that you're consuming. Um, where do you, Maureen, where do you look for your visual inspiration? Uh, I'm super lucky. I, I wake up in the morning at the, because I'm 11 years in where I have art, as you can see, literally everywhere behind me, like around me. So um, it's it's just a real joy. Um, digitally, it's the same. Um, I'm, I learned so much through digital. I love digital. the digital. It can be an amazing platform if, if you kind of look at it from a house perspective where you learn tons, you're inspired on a daily basis, and you kind of collaborate constantly. Um, and and I love walking. I'm, I'm a big cycling and, and walker. So um, again, kind of walking in the city or not, or at night or during the day, um, there's, um, yeah, I never close my eyes, even if I'm in, in a cab. I try to kind of absorb as much as I can visuals around me so yeah I just I'm again back in the life of privilege where um, I adore my surroundings uh, where I'm in my current context. And do you have any creative outputs yourself? Um... So I feel it's um it's definitely so it's a very creative job in the sense that like I can't tell you the full details of projects coming up next month we were given 10 streets um, to kind of come up with a way to integrate the art in it so my job is definitely like requires a lot of creativity because you have to constantly think, okay, I have, you know, this handbag or I have this kind of situation and, and or this interior and, and then suddenly with the art of our artists, I have to make it and I have to enhance it. Um, so that's occupying a lot of my creativity. Um, I think otherwise I would say that um, I do dance one hour daily. I don't think it was creative. Um, I dance um, in a very ridiculous way like you went from the outside but it makes me very happy it's been a release system since i'm like five um and then i am yeah i my entire life is like my house uh the way i cook the way i set the table the way it's just you know i think it's difficult when you value aesthetics to kind of not conduct it in in every shape or form the only thing i've given up is my son does love the most ugly toys, and I have accepted that as as a way of, of being a loving mother. But I will not just have him <laughs> with the pretty wooden toys, which obviously he doesn't like, and he likes the very orange, green, and purple toys, which do not match the art by any means or any shape. But so that's the only one I've given up on. But the rest, generally, I lead a very aesthetic life. That's good to know. You know, in real life, you can't over curate every aspect. Of it. Um, so I'd love to open it up to questions from the audience if we have any. Um, we had a nice comment from Lancia Marine. I love how you weaved personality into luxury, perfection, nurturing relations like you. I love to design and send handwritten cards. So yeah, it's great to see that people are actually still sending handwritten cards. Um, Oh, completely. Well, we actually um, um, we sent um, a little card with by our artist. She kind of made an artwork during the confinement. We've written "Don't forget to smile," and then we sent it out to all our community. And it was really nice because that week we had a flood on the social media of just pictures of "Don't forget to smile," which was very meaningful as well. So yeah, it's we are big on cards. Did and you anticipate that, that people way. might share them on social media, or was that I think given our community it's definitely a very vocal one um so yes I'm sure there was a point of it I think did I do it solely for this no um I mean the you know ultimately I we need to make sure that our community as well it's 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 a very dependent relationship like um my, our community and us um but yes I mean it's always nice I think 
I've, we've got a community that when we sign a new artist, when we do a project, they are very vocal in supporting it um, on social media, which is really nice. And I think it's to do with the age as well. I think we have definitely a young demographic as much as an older one. And I think your demographic is definitely very active um, on social media for um, us. That's lovely how you kind of include all these personalized uh, elements to your brand. So a as a luxury brand, uh, which MT Art is, um, having these little attention to details. Um, we've got another question. Uh, oh, yeah. Very good point from Diego. Uh, tell us about the artist responsible for the piece behind you, which is incredibly beautiful. <laughs> wow. Well, you can see that Diego is a friend because he's obviously yeah. asked the right questions on that basis. Um, Lauren, this is all an acronym. So it's it's really, um, the computer is put in such a way that if I move it, I would be petrified scared mm -hmm. that something will go terribly wrong. Um, but it's basically you have neon lighting on it and then all the different bits of colors are actually mm -hmm. the paint. And what it does is like it lifts up my dining table at night. So I have a full thing. So, um, okay, this is another story. Um, but basically, as I was younger, I loved to walk at night and I loved to peer through the windows of people. So if you see a weirdo that's kind of looking inside your house, it's actually me because I love kind of looking into interiors and and artworks. So for my house sake, um, I have put quite a few kind of light works like this at night, not far from the windows. And I think if you pass my house, then it kind of it kind of lit itself up, yeah. um, not like a Christmas tree, but actually kind of giving you a few vibes. So this during the day, you see a lot of the paint work, which is like this blend of yeah. purple and pinks and blue, which is really beautiful. And she's all to do Lauren Baker about positive energy as well. Um, but at night, it basically transformed the room. It kind of overpowered it um, with an amazing positive light. You, well. you did a public art project, didn't you, in East London, where you had an artist put lights in the sewers? Um, and yes, <laughs> actually. So my lovely man, uh, who I'm with luckily for the past six years, was still <laughs> accepting all this madness. Um, he is a VC, so he invests in B2B tech companies. And he, um, which will be perfect for your article as well, so forward it. And he basically, um, um, you know, gives money to entrepreneurs in the B2B tech scene as, as a VC, kind of investing in them. And on that day, I was like seven months into my company and we had designed this beautiful ballet of lighting that was going to be put in the sewer drain. Lovely idea. So as you walk at night, basically it will activate the different kind of holes into the sewer drain. And, and I love that because I think if you have, I want to do actually many more of them because if you go, if you think of like quite a dark um, street, especially as a woman, you might not take it. But actually, if you have something that this is very poetic, you might take it a lot more. But there's a funny story where an entrepreneur pitched to my boyfriend on the morning of that project. And then at night, he saw him cleaning a shoe drain and he thought the, the VC had gone bankrupt because we basically didn't realize that um, we also had to clean it. I never thought about that part. I'm obviously creative enough, but not pragmatic enough to think that the sewer drain would have also been disgustingly dirty. We now have a team, we're all good. But at the time, like we had to basically, myself, him and him and I kind of clean, the, clean up the, each shoe drain before we could put it in. But it was amazing. It was just so poetic. And I hope we can do more like this because I think um, I was walking at night last week. Um, I live not far from Oxford Street. and especially since the confinement i found that there's a lot less women at night kind of walking around it's a lot of groups of men which is nothing wrong with that but i think lighting could do a big difference in terms of making sure that the streets feel safe and the kind of people kind of walk around in a way that yeah. they feel safer as well and and happier as well so i yeah i, so I love well this as safety, project you know just increasing everybody's um sort of sense of well-being by seeing these lights appearing at night and again sort of similar to you yeah, know, increasing people's well-being as they walk past and see your your beautiful artwork. Yeah, and you know what? It's ultimately art. You know, we've shown that art can enhance anything from the most beautiful architecture of Rosewood to a sewer drain. And I think that's the point is that, you know, everything in life can be enhanced and, and can be looked at through a different lens or different angle. And, and I think art does that very well. It activates uh, places and spaces in such a beautiful way. Um, 
So the, we've got another question from Thiago. Hope, sorry, I hope Lee, I said your name right. Um, how do you think art is redefining luxury brands? How do you think you mean how are they redefining it? Um, I think there's definitely, is that correct, right? How, how they, do you think art sorry. is redefining luxury brands? Oh, right, okay. I, you know, I think that that relationship has always been there. Um, and, and you know, like Cocteau was doing many partnerships and has always been kind of, because ultimately luxury brands were usually the story of someone that was very passionate at first and kind of created mm -hmm. the most amazing something. So that it was always in, in kind of intrinsic that they will collaborate with artists as well. I think um, that's what I like about it is I think especially if a, very, if a luxury brand has become very corporate, I think it adds an intensity, a new voice, a freshness to kind of telling the story. And I think the artist can help doing that, specifically if the brand is not directing the artist, because I think the artist can actually add something that's authentic in how they view it. Um, and then you can create a dialogue between the two fronts because as we all know, sometimes the brands become so big that the what was very magical at the start, that story that everyone loved may be lost a little because it, it may be feeling like it's that kind of huge corporate. And and I think artists add a lot of value by kind of giving again um, a human yeah. voice to what that. What did you, you think know? of the Louis Vuitton, Jeff Koons collaboration? I feel <laughs> this is, like my team is laughing in the background. Um, I feel, um, I what do I feel? I feel if depends on the brief, and that's me being very British and political about it. I think if the brief is the brief is to get people to talk about it and sell a lot of items, then I think that was a good attempt for it. Although I heard that the sales actually may not have been as high as expected. Um, I feel. You know, it's a good alignment of two major brands, basically. That's what I feel. Is it an artist and brand collaboration? No, for me, because I think that's more of a brand versus a brand collaboration. But that's fine too. It just, it's less the idea of kind of giving the authenticity and the freshness. I just talked about. that. It's more the idea of having two monsters um, aligning for the two demographics and the PR to kind of align. So I would say it's more as if two brands basically kind of walked into a big partnership together. Um, and in that sense, then that will be, that's a success, <laughs> if that makes sense. Um, uh, so just checking if we've got any more um, questions in the chat box. Got a couple of tech queries. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I can't believe I was there on time. This is a complete surprise. It's not thanks to me. Thank so. you, team. From your end. Um, <laughs> I don't think so. In which case, I'm going to say thank you very much, Maureen. So fascinating. Um, well, thank you so much. And I yes. hope I get to meet you in the flesh soon. And I will kind of go and read your <laughs> avatar stories so we can compare what's going on in the art world as so well. Thank you for having me. And thank you, Diego, as well, for introducing me to this amazing week. And I look forward to listening There's to one, one the more rest question of the before you go. Sorry, we've got uh, any consideration about art and well being during the pandemic? Yeah, so that's actually an interesting one, um, and it's a nice one to kind of end on. So at the start of the confinement, you know, I, I, I'm not a necessity worker, just to clarify before I'm going to say anything. And and therefore, you know, we never position ourselves as such. And But we got so many messages on the fact that, you know, the artists and, and what they were doing digitally and the, the, the lucky people were able to afford their art, the ones that were able to kind of be around their partnerships, were telling us that generally it helped them uh, putting it through, which was really nice because we were creating loads of artistic content as well. So we kind of did this mini interviews of the artists in the studios and we really kind of encouraged our artists to kind of give constantly a lot of content as well. And it was just really nice because we had a flood of those lovely messages throughout the confinement on how much it was helpful. And, and you know, I always like, as you can, you know, as you saw through the TED Talks, I've done well-being studies for the public outside of things but i'm very careful in 
in how we phrase it because of course health and education are still a priority first and foremost you know um but it was absolutely lovely therefore to see that this was really of value and 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 uh, the us of our company was were generally uh, delivering value on, on that sense so for me it was very heartwarming um and it was a you know, I created that that company for that reason. So it's always a nice thing when it's being verified by by your community. Absolutely, and you know, if we've learned a few lessons from the pandemic, it's to you know enjoy the simple pleasures in life, like beautiful art and being surrounded by our friends and family. Um, exactly. Okay. Thank you so much, Maureen. Yeah, I hope I hope to meet you in real life <laughs> soon. Um, well, take care, everyone, thank so and thank you for listening to us.